Welcome to episode 166, Client Meaning Making, Working with Spirituality and Psychotherapy, featuring Dr. Russell Seiler Jones, licensed mental health counselor. Make sure to subscribe to be alerted about future episodes by Clearly Clinical. Learn, grow, shine. Hello to our listeners. My name is Beth Irias, and today we're having a conversation about religion and spirituality and therapy. This can sometimes be a really complicated and loaded topic, and I am delighted today to be joined by Dr. Russell Seiler Jones. He is a psychotherapist in Asheville, North Carolina, and he has been working in the realm of spiritually integrated therapy for a long time, and he joins us today to shed some light on this topic. Thank you so much for joining us, Russell. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So why don't you take a moment and tell our listeners a bit about yourself and how you came to really focus in on this particular specialization in terms of your therapeutic work? So before I even do that, you said something in an introduction that I want to tag on to. You said this is a complicated topic. And so I want to acknowledge that and acknowledge everybody listening to this conversation that... um, You are likely to hear some things you really vibe with, and you're likely to hear some things that are unsettling or disturbing or create some tension or sense of conflict within you. And I just want to make space for all of that. And and, and I've written a book, and in the book I talk about a notion called spiritual countertransference. And it means that in the same way that we have responses to everything else about our clients, lives, we have responses to their spiritual or religious selves and the things they share about themselves in that way. And we learn as therapists to work with countertransference by, first of all, just being aware of it, acknowledging and validating the response we have as real and legit and important. And so I tend not to edit myself. I tend to say exactly what I think in interviews or conversations like this. Um, but I, but, and, and I do that in part because I would like for you to have your countertransference reaction here, listening to this, um, while, where you have some space, maybe in some buffer to process it, um, instead of hearing it and having that reaction, maybe unprocessed with a client. In session. Yeah. So in Very session. Good yeah. 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 So, Very good point. Thank um, you. Yes. And so anyway, that's just a. Uh, maybe a word of welcome to people listening, like bring your whole selves, let it be real for you and um, follow up, you know, any trailheads that get marked in this conversation, you know, I encourage you to follow follow them because my hope is that from this conversation, you will feel more capable and more really excited about moving towards your client's spirituality. Um so, and we'll get into that, I'm imagining, in this conversation. But anyway, I wanted to say all that before I asked and responded to the actual question you asked. Um, and so, I got into this as a minister. I, um, after college, I, I went to college to be a football coach. Um, I ended up basically becoming smitten with the college chaplain, this really wise old man. And um, just thinking like he had such authenticity and integrity and depth of being. I was just drawn by him, magnetized by him. And so that led me into preparing to be a minister myself. And I was for uh, four or five years and um, probably just wasn't mature enough to do the job. And so I got out of being a, a... uh, a, a pastor in a church and began training to be a chaplain and had some deep conversion experiences. There's a word, conversion, right? Some deep conversion experiences. Uh, when I say I wasn't mature enough to be a minister, I wanted so badly to change people. I wanted people to think like I thought, to have the same kind of social, cultural values that I had. And I was so frustrated. Um, and in the Training I took as a chaplain, I had this conversion like, oh, my my place on this planet is more to accompany than to change people. You know, I, I, the, the, the world has one Russell Siler Jones and that's enough. And um, 
my role is to accompany people. And so that led me down the path of becoming a therapist. So I, but I brought into therapy um, this whole um, kind of sensitivity and awareness and interest in the spiritual dimension of human living. So, um, and then, you know, I've been a therapist now for, I don't, 30 something years. And uh, so it's just been a part of the way I listen to people and respond to people. Um, it's been there throughout, but it's definitely grown as I've um, just thought more and experienced more about how, how to make contact with that part of people's lives. Thank you. Thank you for explaining kind of where you're coming at this conversation from. And in our initial conversation, when we first met, I remember talking with you about the, our board's considerations about this topic because this can be so loaded, you know, of, of, I, I remember the conversation that we had had in, in the interview called violence of advice with Stephen Andrew, and that, you know, this heavy therapeutic focus of the way things should be, what somebody should do. And I think for a lot of therapists, that when we get into religious or spiritual discussion, maybe we're afraid of crossing that line into advice or what somebody should do. And it goes from a, a role of accompaniment, like you said, to a role of advisement, which is very different. Um, so thank you for your also kind of introduction of like, hey, if you have lots of big feelings about this, then you're probably doing it right. And better for you to have some big yes. feelings about this now. And we can think through what's, you know, what's happening. So why don't we just dive right in? I know that this question um, is highly interpretive. How do you define religion? And then how do you define, define spirituality? Let's start by defining those two and then branching off. Okay. Religion is pretty straightforward to define. And the field of psychotherapy is pretty much in consensus that religion means the shared beliefs or values of a, of a particular community. Um, and so religion is a group thing. A group of people has come together, gathered around a, um, a set of ideas and values and practices, and they support one another in deepening into those beliefs and values and practices. So it's a group thing. Spirituality is absolutely impossible to define. I think you can describe it, but I've never read a definition of spirituality that I like. Um, I've never written one that I like. Uh, so, um, but so just w w acknowledging that whatever I say, even in the direction of a definition, is going to be flawed or, and, and inadequate. The way I think, I think of spirituality as, first of all, it's innate uh, that that all people have a spiritual orientation. Um, one way, one way I could say it is, uh, spirituality is the is the relationship we have with the depths of our own being. Um, and it's also the relationship between the depth of our own being and the mysterious depth of the universe. And religions have different names for mysterious, what, <laughs> what the mysterious depth of the universe is. But I think most religions, when you go to the heart of them, they all say it's mystery it's unnameable. It's ineffable. You know, the Tao Te Ching begins with the words, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. So spirituality is this deeper than words since we have that there's more to the re there's more to reality than what can be seen or observed, measured, uh, more to reality than I guess the material that, that, that the reality of our lives cannot be reduced to this measurable, scientifically observable, and provable and verifiable dimension. Um, spirituality is sort of a, it's a way of, of, it's a way of knowing, a way of seeing. It's also a way of being. Um, I, another thing I would say about spirituality is it's not this roped off separate section of our lives. We, you know, when, when we talk about spirituality, we're obviously speaking about it in some kind of particular, what, what's particular or you, essential about spirituality, but it's always connected with every other dimension of our life. Um, so with the, the, there's a phrase in the world of therapy, biopsychosocial spiritual. And uh, the, the, the gist of what that means is 
that all of these dimensions of our lives are um, interrelated with one another. When you're having a psychological experience, you're also having a somatic experience or a relational experience and a spiritual experience. When you're having a spiritual experience, it's also a biological experience, a psychological and a social relational experience. So uh, I could talk for 45 more minutes just trying to <laughs> put words around what spirituality is. Uh, and But hopefully that's enough to get us in the ballpark. And I'm, wonder, I'm, I'm actually wondering what lands with you, what strikes you about what I've said and uh, maybe even like some clarification I, I might offer in response to thoughts you're having. What stood out to me was the idea that religion is community based and and almost inherently associated with a, a group. Um, and I could yes. see where spirituality could either be or and be highly yes. individual while also being practiced in a group setting and within a community. So kind of the the similarities and differences there. And how I was hearing spirituality in my meaning or in, in my interpretation is really the meaning making. And in what you said that stood out to me was the biopsychosocial spiritual. And I, speaking as a documentation trainer, we talk about biopsychosocials. Like that's what we call them. That is honestly yes. what we generally yeah. call them in treatment. Yeah. We don't even, like, we know that there's like that spiritual section at the very end. Um, but we, even conceptually as a field from an administrative standpoint, I think we often leave off that last element. But if we're looking at this through the lens of, say, narrative therapy, which is entirely based around meaning making and the language we're using to describe our experience and interpretation of the world around us and ourselves and events and feelings and all of that, that meaning making almost makes me think that we should really be calling it the spiritual biopsychosocial treatment model, <laughs> not tacking that on the end. <laughs> right. You're, you're saying meaning is so essential to the work we're doing. You know, I, I, I always think of therapy as like, if you really boil it down, we're trying to help people live more of the life they want to live. It's not our job to tell them what the life they ought to live is. Uh, it's not our, that, that's not our task. You know, we, we hopefully sit in a very humble posture and uh, we, <laughs> we don't ask rhetorical questions. We don't ask questions we think we know the answer to. We ask questions we are genuinely ignorant of because the other person needs to tell us how it is. Um, but, uh, boy, that was a bit of a rant. And now I've lost the <laughs> I've actually lost the trade of thought. But I, I want to actually focus in on what you just said in this idea of our job is to ask questions and actually be invested in what comes out of the client in response to that instead of this presupposition where we basically potentially set a trap where it's like, and pounce. And that and you know, that's a separate conversation about the confrontation that may occur in therapy. And by confrontation, I don't mean like put your dukes up. I mean, sometimes the gentle confrontation where we go, have you noticed that? So there's that. Like sometimes Absolutely. it's trap, like it's bait and trap. <laughs> but But I can hear what you're saying in the realm of spirituality and religion. And I think that that's actually where things get complicated in talking about this as therapists is because of the idea of, well, if you want to abide by my interpretation of the Bible, right, then right. you should. Right. And that's right. where it gets into, I think, this kind of scary territory for therapists is around the should exactly. that I, I think for some of us is really uncomfortable. So... I, what I, one, one thing I would say in response to what you just said, I think this leads really nicely. W one thing I try to say to therapists when I have the opportunity to talk with them on this topic is there are two basic pillars that working with spirituality rests upon. One is move toward the spirituality of your client. The second is draw upon, but do not impose your own. And that first one, move towards the spirituality of your client. It really means that. I mean, these these two stand together, actually. Um, but but the the gist of what we're doing is we are showing interest and curiosity in the way our client makes meaning, um, in the um, beliefs or practices that help that are resources in their lives, in the struggles. Um, 
And it might be struggle in a religious context. You know, um, there's research out the wazoo that talks about the overall benefit, uh, psychological and physical health benefit of religion and spirituality. But spirituality also does do harm. Spirituality and religion also cause harm to people as well. Uh, so we move towards their spiritual struggles, their spiritual pain, um, as well as their resources, uh, their spiritual resources, all in the interest of serving the agenda of helping this client live more of the life they want to live. Um, we, we, we can't leave our own spirituality at the door any more than we can leave our gender, our race, um, our own family of origin histories. Those are part of the fabric of who, uh, of who we are. Um, and so we can draw upon whatever spiritual resources or perspectives I, we have as therapists. But there's, there's, a, there's a difference between drawing upon them and imposing them or pushing them. And I, I can, I'll just say very clearly, I think um, it is not a therapist's job to tell any client, um, here is how you ought to be coming at your life from uh, this or that spiritual perspective. It's not a therapist's job to say you should become a Christian, you should become a Buddhist, you should become a cat lover. You know, it's just that there are, there are honorable professions uh, that represent religious traditions um, you know, minister, rabbi, imam. Um, but when we agree to sit in the therapist chair um, and meet people in moments of great vulnerability and tenderness, you know, we want to move towards their, um, we want to move towards the way they relate from the depth of their being to the mysterious depth of the universe, not impose the way we relate from the depths of our being to, uh, to the mysterious depths of the universe. Before we started recording, we talked a bit about religious and spiritual trauma for our listeners. We do have some episodes that specifically discuss these concepts in detail. So I encourage you to take a listen to those. This idea of imposition, I think that's part of where the complication is, is um, the example for myself that's coming up um, after a major natural disaster a number of years ago, I had gone with the Red Cross to do disaster relief. And when we went to the shelter, it, which had been set up by a religious group, um, the folks who were staying at this large shelter were clearly very vulnerable. I mean, they'd lost their homes and a huge catastrophe. Um, but also, it was very clear that this religious group that had set up the shelter had very much required their attendance at religious events, had been trying to convert them, and they were shell-shocked. And, and it was like, I had to like, keep my Red Cross vest on to be like, I'm not one of them. <laughs> like, I just do you need some food? Can I get you some new shoes? Like, who do we need to call? You know, like, because it was so clear that in this unbelievable moment of vulnerability, there was this imposition of values. And that's such a minor example if we look at history, but that this has happened over time where it was like, oh, you believe this? Stop believing that. Come to our our way or else we're going to blah, blah, blah to you, to your home, to your family, to whatever, to your land. So there's this kind of backbone of supremacy in this conversation, which I think is part of what makes it loaded, complicated. So I think that's a great story and really an instructive example Um I don't know what the natural disaster was, but, you know, hurricanes and earthquakes and fires kind of tear through people's lives. And that's how they end up in our offices. And I, 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 what I love, appreciate about your example is we ought to bring the same tenderness to our clients and respect for the, the, the way their world is rocking or reeling that you, you, you wanted to bring to the people in that shelter. And... I, 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 so I'll just speak directly to people who might be li therapists who might be listening, who really do feel very strong and grounded in your own spiritual perspectives, own beliefs and values. And I, I want to say good for you, you know, and, and draw upon those as a resource and draw upon them deeply enough that whatever ways it helps you understand uh, suffering and vulnerability and calls forth 
wisdom and love in you, um, bring those to the encounter with people, you know, bring, bring the respect and care and consideration that your religious tradition um, deepens in you. Bring that to your client. And, I, and I'll just speak for me here <laughs> and say, I bring to every clinical encounter um, the assumption that the person I'm talking with is a spiritual being. And almost everything I do in relationship to people is organized around this deep trust I have that within this other person, there is a source of wisdom and knowing and guidance. Um, I don't have to tell people that that's what I think about them. I have clients who are deeply religious. I have clients who are spiritual but not religious. I have clients who say there's not a spiritual bone in my body, right? And just to speak of that last group, and I don't argue with them. I just take that at face value. I, I think it's kind of best that we sort of let people speak for themselves and know themselves and say what's true for themselves. But So I don't try to say, well, actually, you know, you might be spiritual in some ways you're not even recognizing. I don't say that to people. That would be imposing my spiritual perspective on them. But I still ask them questions that assume not that they're going to speak explicitly to me about religion or spirituality, but that assume that within them they have this innate capacity, um, that uh, any number of innate capacities that I attribute, uh, that, that I frame in a spiritual way. So I believe people have capacities for generosity. People have capacities for kindness. People have capacities for honesty. People have a conscience. <laughs> uh, they, they struggle with things. So I, I see spirituality moving in people's lives, whether we're putting that label on it, putting that explicit label on it or not. Um, and so I, I think there's a way uh, uh, back to the point about religious harm. Um, we don't want to be perpetrators of religious harm either by trying to push an agenda or force a way of thinking on people in a moment of vulnerability or in a moment of not vulnerability. We don't want to do, I don't want to do that anyway. Right. I think the other thing that's coming up for me as we're talking about this is we'll say some major religions or even minor religions. And part of the conflict with therapy is <laughs> what I can only describe as like the instrumental use of shame. <laughs> And I say uh -huh. that as someone who was raised Catholic, <laughs> that like uh -huh. Uh -huh. that yeah. Yeah. Catholics have in some ways, in some interpretations, kind of cornered the market on shame. And so I reflect back on my experiences as a younger child going, oh, wow, <laughs> like that was really foundationally based in shame. Um, and like, so how how do any of us that have a very clear well, I guess all of us have on some level either an opaque or a clear perspective about the way the world works and why and how things happen, our meaning making. But if we're really adamant that uh, somebody's premarital sexual contact will result in them going to hell, we believe deeply in hell, how, how do you recommend clinicians work within that space? What what is your prescription as someone who's basically explored this for your entire career, your adult life? How do we work within that space when it's really um, overt of like, my God, my beliefs, my spirituality, whatever says what you're doing is bad and you need to stop doing it, whatever that is. Or you need to do more of that in order to get to whatever is coming or is after a part of this life, if you believe that. Let me make sure I understand your question. What what does a therapist do yeah. if they have those beliefs that are super strong? Yeah. Like how, how do we yeah. okay. keep, keep it in check so that we don't contribute to possible shame, rapport breaking, supremacy, abuse of power? Like I think – and I think that's where – things get complicated. And how I even view this is like, you know, you and I talked about it before, but like the idea of what is quote unquote Christian therapy, like that is a highly interpretive and complicated concept. But so for clinicians who are listening that are like, this is how I organize the world. This is how I, I, I feel very strongly. This is the way the world works. What do we need to do 
to checkity check that? Well, I I think um, I've got several responses to that. Uh, first of all, I think that the, the 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 best response to that would happen one on one or in a small in a trusted group of people where we can get into the particulars um, for that particular clinician. So I'm acknowledging that okay, that's a big question uh, and a good one and. You know, you know how sometimes people on medical advice shows will say, "Now, you really need to make sure you talk with your doctor about <laughs> <Yes>. this," <laughs> because any broad advice or statements I might make might not really apply to you, and really need to. It, it's so new. Things are. This is such a nuanced question. Um, but to, to to persons who have a strong sense of conviction, religious conviction, um, I would say first of all. Find a community of people, other therapists that you trust, who respect you um, and whom you respect, that you can be in really honest conversation about this. I think countertransference, this is, this is an example of religious or spiritual countertransference, and countertransference does harm when it remains hidden. You know, we, we need to bring our countertransference awarenesses into community and conversation with people we trust. So that's one thing I would say. So w one more thing I'll add, um, I'm speaking somewhat to the therapist who has strong religious conviction and may want to, may feel a, like a, a sense of spiritual duty to share those convictions or beliefs. Um, but I'm, I'm speaking to everybody here too. Um, and, 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 and what I want to say here is if you lined up 40 people, in a room, you know, or in a field, just get 40 people together. Um, you would recognize all of them. You would say, oh, that's a human being. There are no giraffes gathered in this room. These are all people. But you would be able to pick them apart. They're all physically distinctive. And um, if one of their best friends came into the room, they would be able to find their best friend just because they look different from the other 39 people. And if that's true physically of people, if that's true about people physically, you know, why would it be any less true of people spiritually? Um, and so just in terms of clinical utility, clinical effectiveness, I think we get farther with people. We, um, in a psychological sense, in a behavioral sense, but also in a spiritual sense, I think we get farther with people if we help them to know their unique spiritual fingerprint. And if we try to move towards that rather than trying to take whatever our spiritual fingerprint is or the kind of spiritual values of our particular spiritual community and, and introduce that, I think we get better. Uh, I think we get better results as, as therapists if we move toward the spirituality of the client rather than um, trying to assume a spiritual set of clothes might be a good fit for that person. Let's find out what, the, what they actually wear. You said a lot there that I think was really powerful to highlight. One of the first things you said was around this concept of informed consent. I think, I think that is a really important one. And I think we often think of as informed consent as like an administrative procedure, but I think there is this element of transparency of like, if, if I have these really strong belief systems, I mean, our entire practice is founded around working with queer folk. That's all over our website. It's all over our office. Yeah. Like, and right. it's, it's on right. our sign for goodness sake. So it's, it's like very clear of like this, this is what we do and believe here. And I appreciate what you're saying about these belief systems that if we're really serious about something and it's really foundational to how we view ourselves and the world around us, that there is this element of informed consent of, you know, do we need to be transparent with prospective or actual clients about that fact and own it? Um, and the other thing you said that stood out to me was this example about being able to recognize people and also recognize their inherent differences. And, you know, you're talking about it in terms of clothing, but I'm imagining like 
what kind of shampoo you use what what works with your style yeah. of hair like what if, if you yeah. if you're a person who wears makeup what shade is your skin what foundation do you use and how highly individual that is so i appreciate the simplicity of that analogy which it would be like me reaching into my purse if a client said oh i i need foundation and me being like here use mine like what's the probability that they're gonna have the mm-hmm. same skin tone yeah. as i do um or the same needs of their skincare that i do but so i appreciate the simplicity of that analogy um because i think it also doesn't take away from the importance and the significance of spirituality and religion in all of our lives it's more just understanding the limitations of imposing them inflicting them on somebody else with an expectation of there being a right way to navigate the world yeah you know what what i'm uh a couple of thoughts in response to what you just said i am gluten intolerant you know for I went to Mexico. I ate something on the street. I got sick. When I came home, my gut biome had changed. And I finally figured out if I don't eat gluten, everything's happy. And if I do, it things get unhappy. Um, in the same way, you know, in the same way that I'm gluten intolerant, people have um, strong, they can have strong negative reactions to particular religious ideas that are particular to their spiritual gut biome, right? And so, I don't want to say the word God around somebody who unravels uh, around that word, around someone who's experienced deep spiritual harm, um, around uh, someone for whom that word brings like this cascade, uh, like a a traumatic cascade of of, um, flashbacks and actual physical associations, right? I really want to I don't want to serve gluten to, you know, a friend who's gluten intolerant. And I want to be equally sensitive and aware of the spiritual location, um, the spiritual language, the spiritual um, uh, spiritual world that this particular client occupies. You know, because, I, I, again, the, the big goal in therapy, I want to help people live more of the lives they want to live. Not the lives that you might want for them. Yeah, yeah. And um, I do believe that when we move towards people's spirituality, and I mean that their explicit spirituality, like if they say, um, if they say an explicit, let, 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 they say, I've been praying about this, but I don't seem to be getting anywhere. They just introduced an explicit spiritual word. So I might say, you know, you mentioned, you said prayer. Do you? Would you, would you mind telling me more about the role of prayer in your life or how you pray or your experience about praying about this? But just don't ignore that word, that explicit spiritual word. Um, move towards it, right? But also move towards implicit spiritual experiences. So um, the religious traditions use words that don't sound a lot, really all that religious. They talk about peace or they talk about love, or they talk about patience, or they talk about kindness, right? Um, When you hear clients using those kinds of words, you know, I've I've begun to feel more peaceful about this. Move towards peaceful. Um, I mean, more peaceful. Can you tell me more about that? Or how do you mean? You know, that's not a hard question to ask. And I don't know the answer. I said earlier, the the good questions in therapy are the ones we don't know the answer to. I don't know what peaceful means to them. I don't know what peaceful feels like in their body. I don't know um, how peaceful affects the way they're thinking about this. Uh, But but move towards it. Or maybe they don't use a word at all, but they're talking about something. And I, I, I don't know, you see tears in their eyes. They're talking about, let's say they're talking about their life and kind of how hard it is and they begin to, you just see tears in their eyes. So move towards the tears because tears look a lot, I mean, in that moment, I'm thinking this person might be feeling some compassion for themselves. So they're they're talking about their life, their struggles. You see some tears in their eyes, like, you know, just to say, like, I see your eyes, you know, um, what? What, what what's happening there and 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 and, and what's going on well I'm, t- I'm i'm tearing up uh-huh can you stay with that um so i'm moving towards it 
uh, can you stay with that? Um, if those tears could talk, what might they say? Um, things are really difficult for me. Um, and as you see things being so difficult for you, how are you feeling towards yourself? I'm feeling some like some care for myself, some compassion for myself. You know, that compassion in all spiritual traditions and in my mind, <laughs> too, is a spiritual energy. It's a spiritual capacity. Someone doesn't have to and, and, and they might not use words for it. They might show you compassion just by tearing up or their throat, you know, their voice might get a little raspy or hoarse the way our voice changes when some energy in our heart changes. Um, so move towards our client spirituality means move towards it explicitly. Tell me more. It moves, but also all these different implicitly spiritual words or biopsycho behaviors that someone might demonstrate right there in front of us. I, I believe when that happens, it's like spirituality is like waving its hand at me, the therapist, saying, "Here I am. I'm here. I'm going to help. Just come a little closer. We're going to." We, Move towards this. Let's un let's unpack what might be here. Um, it's a powerful resource, uh, and I'm sure there are lots of therapists listening to this who've had moments when you've moved towards your client's spirituality, and it's just opened up space for transformation that you didn't have any idea was there before. The idea of the implicit spirituality, I think, is a really powerful one. These belief systems, the meaning making, you know, for example, the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, we all have so many belief systems around why does this bad thing keep happening to me? Or why have so many bad things happened to my neighbor? Or, you know, how do we explain the good and bad and in between things? And you're right that some of that may be very explicit. I do X, Y, Z behavior in order to make sense of this, or this is a very clear, clear calling that I need to go to temple, that I need to speak with my rabbi, that I, whatever it is. Um, but then also the extension of that about what about the implicit of how I'm interpreting this information through a filter that is unique to me about what all of this means and how I relate to the world around me. Yeah. Me, Meaning making, whether somebody puts um, religious words in their meanings, in the meaning story they tell themselves, whether they put explicitly religious words in that story or not, meaning making is, in my view, it is a spiritual activity. Um, why, why am I here on this planet? You know, what, what am I here to do? What's the purpose of this life I'm living? How do I make sense out of this circumstance or this stress, this this storm that's blown through my life. How do I, how, how, how do I kind of rearrange the way I relate to myself and to others on the basis of this? Um, those are spiritual um, exercises that people are, are, are undergoing. Those are spiritual conversations. And again, I don't like to mess them up by saying, hey, do you realize we're having a spiritual conversation now? I just want to stay in the conversation. So, you know, I, I said earlier, don't impose your spirituality on your client. But one thing that you'll see happen a lot is clients impose their own spirituality on themselves. So they they will, um, rather than being kind of true and genuine to the actual experience they're having, they'll try to force sometimes their own experience into a particular um religious box or um, religious shape that's consistent with what they believe or what their community believes. And sometimes, you know, when the clients themselves don't even realize that, they're, that we're having a spiritual conversation, they get farther and more things open up. They, they, they explore new territory. They break new ground. Um, so, I'm, I'm again, uh, I want to have the conversations in the language that the client is using. And... Um, it's not that I would never make reference, be the one to introduce the client's spiritual perspective. You know, if someone has told me previously, like that they read, um, they read the Quran, um, read from the Quran uh, several times a week. And I know that's an important resource in their life, an important way they make meaning. And they're talking about some issue or struggle in their life. I might be the one to ask them, you know, I know you read Quran. 
Um, are there words f- f- there? Are there words there that shed any light on all this for you? I might be the one to introduce that. But much of the time, I might be thinking, "Wow, this is a very deep spiritual conversation," and never name that, never acknowledge that, because once you introduce a client's spiritual language, they there's a chance that they will begin imposing it on their experience instead of allowing their experience to unfold uh, kind of organically and naturally as it might. I think that's an important point to consider about the self-imposition. And I, I know that I have certainly uh, watched that happen in therapy. And it is, uh, it, it is well, and, and then there's just rich material there to unpack around what just happened you were you started to say something and then you stopped yourself and went oh yes <laughs> right and and so that even that even that moment that you, that, that you just saw whenever you said what just happened you know it's it's the it's when people are surprised by something that they i think the pos- the, the, the windows for change open up so much more widely um by surprise than they do by us continuing to do the thing that we think is going to make it better, right? You have recently in this conversation been kind of laying the groundwork for conversations that integrate, make space for, permit, invite spirituality and potentially religion. Do you want to talk more about that? Are there more examples for that of basically how do we clinically create fertile ground for this? So you've said use the client's language, um, probably don't name it as it's happening because it may kind of make make that animal that's come out go sucked back into the cave again and go, oh, no. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But w- what else do you recommend for really supporting these spiritual conversations in psychotherapy? Most spiritual conversations – begin at the client's initiative. Um, they will say, you know, I've been talking to my rabbi about this, or uh, my soul is in anguish. Um, they, they'll say something explicit like that, and we just say, will you tell me more about that, or how so, how do you mean? Um, or, as I've said, they may begin implicitly, like someone says, I'm feeling so guilty about this, or... Um, I just don't know what to do. They're 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 engaged in a moral a, a moral struggle. Will you tell me more about that, or how do you mean? So we just we move towards what the client brings forward, um, and I would say ninety percent of engaging spirituality in therapy is just responding to things that clients bring up in the spontaneous flow of a conversation. That said. One simple way to kind of organize spirituality in your own mind as a therapist is to think about think about it manifesting your client's spirituality manifesting in two ways. One is as resource and one is as struggle. So I would say give a give particular ear to um, what are the resources in this person's life that to use implicit spiritual language, Bring them a sense of peace or bring them a sense of joy or bring them courage or creativity or to use explicit language. What are the resources in this person's life that help them feel connected to God? And, you know, it might be something like traditionally religious, like they go to worship or they read scripture or they pray. Um, But it might be that they walk in nature. Um, It might be music. It might be dancing. It might be going running with their friends. It might be playing with their kids. Like, where are you? Who are you with? And what are you doing when you feel alive? <laughs> when when the life force just wells up and surges in you or when you feel connected to God. So listening for and asking about resources, any of those questions I just said are legit questions. And, and I, I can imagine therapists using those questions all the time. Um, what, what brings you a sense of hope? What are you, what's helping you get through this situation? But we also move towards struggle. Um, and that could be explicit struggle, like um, um, this tragedy has befallen me and I used to believe in God and now I just don't. Will you tell me more about that? It could be implicit struggle. 
the one I used a moment ago is guilt. Like I've, I've done something. I feel so ashamed about it. I don't know how I'm going to live with myself. How will I? I'll use a real, I'll use a religious word here. How will I atone for my mistakes? Um, for this big mistake I've made, we move towards that. And in the same way that in kind of fishing out resources that we might ask, what's been getting you through? Or when do you feel most alive? Or when do you feel connected to God? With struggles, we can ask questions too. Like we might say, um, this that you're going through, how is it affecting you in the, at the deepest levels? Or this struggle that you're going through, has it affected you in any way that you would call spiritually? In, 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 in any way that you would call spiritual. Um, so we can go fishing for <laughs> for questions like that, uh, with questions like that as well. Um, but just being aware that there's this internal conversation that's happening inside people all the time. And sometimes it's conscious. Largely, it's unconscious. Mostly people are thinking, you know, how am I going to get this task done that these 14 things I've got to get done today and does this person like me? And what's for lunch? But beneath those kinds of questions that really occupy our mind, that our conscious attention a lot, there are these substrata questions like, who am I really? Um, what's the meaning of this life I'm living? And we can, we can kind of dip in and ask questions that, that draw people out in those ways um, as, as, as ways of inviting spirituality forward and, and helping it be a topic of conversation, either explicitly or implicitly. Let, let me pause there, though, and just ask what I said, which was kind of a mouthful. Like, if there's anything it, that you want to follow up on about that, or if it would be helpful for me to give maybe, uh, describe some clinical example, um, just what, 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 what do you think is best at this point? Well, what I heard you say was that part of the benefit or a huge amount of the benefit of leaning into these conversations about spiritual or religious topics, whether that's explicit or implicit, is really helping clarify somebody's beliefs and values and moving them toward more connection and richness with those things. So as you were talking, there were just like all these models that were kind of popping up in my mind about narrative therapy, about person-centered, about um, solution-focused. Just so many different ideas were coming up in my mind. And this extension of the research about kind of value-based living and that we're much more likely to make decisions that are that feel good to us. We don't experience as much regret uh, or guilt if we are using our values to make decisions and that there's kind of this common thread there, which is, again, it's it's not about what the therapist believes. It's about what the person believes for themselves, that client, and helping kind of, I guess, clear away some of the clutter around that idea. I mean, like, wait, there's something here. Like, can we, can we go here a little bit more? A question I have for you, um, just because I'm curious, how you, like, for someone who engages in these conversations so often, sometimes part of therapy is joining you know, so, oh my gosh, have you tried that restaurant? They have the best chicken tikka masala, you know, and what do you do when a client invites you to join in their spiritual or religious interpretation of something? A, when you agree, when that vibes with you and that works, and then B, when you don't. I'm just curious, how, how do you manage that? How do you do that redirect when they say, you know, how could anybody believe that that is not sinful or that you're not going to go to hell for saying and doing that? And you're like, Ugh. <laughs> well, let's just take that one. How, how can somebody, anybody believe that that's not sinful? And I, I might say, so I hear that this is super strong for you, right? And are, are you asking, are you really asking that question or are you just making a statement, right? So, I mean, I, I, I would... Just want to see where the conversation would go. Or maybe I would say, um, that is so strong for you, right? How did that, how did that come to be so strong for you? Like, who taught you that? Um, was there somebody really important in your life that, I don't know, that you learned that from? So I don't, I mean, I, I would say never. 
<laughs> there's probably, I mean, I, there's got, there's bound to be an exception. But I never get into debates about religion with anybody. You know, if it's an idea that I disagree with, I'm, I, I'm not going to move it that head on. I'm going to ask them, like, how did that come to be important for you? Um, where did, and, and what does it mean to you? Like, to have that, how does it kind of add meaning or value or perspective or connection to your life? Um, and what's it, what is it like for you knowing that other people don't see it that way? Um, I, I'm just moving in with curiosity and I, I, I'm really, I say this to, <laughs> I, I supervise a lot of students, a lot of therapists and, and do a good bit of teaching. And one thing I say a fair bit is curiosity and humility will take you the whole way, right? It'll, it'll get you everywhere you need to go, uh, with anybody. And, I, so I, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with somebody. Now, if someone, if someone is, is a harm doer with their, so we, we, we talked earlier about religious harm. You have a different conversation with someone when they are the one who has been harmed than you do when they're the one that you think might be doing harm spiritually. And so the, 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 the man who, um, has a couple of kids at home and a gay couple moves in next door and he doesn't want his kids to play with their kids because he doesn't approve of the mom's lifestyles, right? Um, and you know or you imagine that if he plays that out with his next door neighbors, that the neighbor's kids and maybe his own kids are going to be harmed in some way by this, Right. And you feel some moral obligation as a therapist to engage a perpetrator of harm, right? Um, it's, it's, it's not likely that they're going to change their thoughts or beliefs or practices if you just say, you know, I'm concerned that by your bringing that attitude, you might hurt these kids' feelings or you might inadvertently, you know, I, I, you're, you're trying to be loyal to to your own values and you're trying to teach your own kids what you believe is right. But, you know, does, does your religion, does your faith teach, how does it teach you to, to speak for what you think is right in ways that are consistent with the, all the other values of your religion? So, I mean, I might get into that conversation with them. Like, how are you wielding your ideas? Are you wielding your ideas in a way that may be counter to the faith that you're actually trying to be loyal to? But I'm not going to tell that person, you know, what you think about this is just out and out wrong. I, um, because I don't think that's going to that, – we're not going to have – that'll be the last conversation we have. <laughs> yeah. Any chance I have of, 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 of having any influence or helping this person kind of deepen their own journey is lost at that point. So, that's, that's delicate. And I, I, I'm not even sure if the example I gave is – relevant to the question you asked, but hopefully that example opens something up for someone listening to this. Um, I think it is relevant. And it reminds me of the conversation that I had had with Lambers Fisher in the um, course called When Client Therapist Values Clash, because we were talking about this idea of like, what do we do? Not So we, we think about what about when our values are in conflict and how do we work around that conflict? But then there's also the simultaneous issue about what about when our values are in agreement and then how do we not... Um, side sort and say, oh, well, we, we, therapist and client, we believe this and all of those people are wrong. <laughs> but so how do any of us move through those spaces when these are really intimate belief systems that we're talking about? Um, and I think you, you kind of touched upon those concepts. I'm imagining a lay person listening to this interview being like, oh, man, Russell would just therapize them. <laughs> 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 I would, but I'll tell you why I would. It's because I trust it. I I really trust that the the um I mean just to be completely transparent, I feel like I'm doing the same two things over and over again as a therapist. I'm trying to help my client be a deeper witness to the reality of their own life, their own experience. Like stop skimming over the surface, explore this, find out what you know. Find out how this is really affecting you. Um, find out what you think, what you feel, what your body is telling you. Be a deeper witness to the reality of your own experience. And then 
from that knowing what needs to happen, you know, what, what agency, um, what mobilization to action or choice or freedom um, is yours now to do? What's this moment? What do you want? Based on now on what you know, what do you want? And um, or what does maybe it's maybe there's nothing really you want. This moment is so horrible. There's but what's being called up? What's being asked of you in this moment? So I just so believe that that's my job because, uh, you know, is to hold up a mirror, ask questions that help people explore their their reality, their story, their truth, their wisdom more deeply and trans help you know what now needs to happen you know <laughs> serenity, serenity prayer um is is there something here that you, is what needs to happen here some move towards serenity accepting something that's beyond your control to change is um what needs to happen now some act of courage to to take action to change something that you can change um and what wisdom is yours to discern <laughs> between those two? Um, so, I, yeah, I would therapize because I really believe in therapy. I believe, I believe it's a powerful practice. I believe it's a generous practice. I believe it's, I believe it's, I believe it's a gift beyond words when someone helps us pay attention to our lives and calls out our own power and agency from us. I mean, I don't mean like inflated power. I mean our actual power. What's what's within our capacity to do here? We could just keep talking, truly. I mean, this is one of those topics that you could never uncover and flip over every stone. It's just impossible. And our relationship to our spirituality and our personalities are ever evolving. Um, for our listeners that want to learn more about you, about these concepts, please tell us again a little bit about your book, You've introduced a lot of ideas that I think are really important. And for our listeners, I want to kind of restate one of them that Dr. Jones mentioned was this idea of spiritual countertransference. Another was this idea of these two pillars of spirituality and therapy, which is number one, move toward the spirituality of your client. And number two, don't impose your spirituality on the client. Um, how do folks learn more about these concepts and learn more about you? Are there other books you recommend? Please tell us. Okay. Well, um, I have a website. Everybody has a website these days, right? Uh, it's my name, RussellSeilerJones.com. Um, I have written a book. It's called Spirit in Session. And the subtitle really addresses those two pillars. Um, uh, the subtitle is Working with Your Client's Spirituality and Your Own in Psychotherapy. So move towards your clients, draw upon, but don't oppose your own. Um, I've written curriculum and helped develop a training program for therapists. Um, there's a 15-hour level one, a 15-hour level two training. It's offered through uh, at the website acpe.edu. Uh, this is an organization that um, has a community of therapists who uh, are drawn to paying attention to spirituality and engaging it in effective and ethical ways. Uh, so this is it's a training in spiritually integrated psychotherapy at acpe.edu. Um, there are like so many wonderful resources in this field. Um, I, I I I'm partial to uh, a couple of writings from a couple of people. One is uh, a, a psychiatrist named James Griffith. Um, and he's got a book called, I think, Encountering the Sacred in Psychotherapy, and another book called Religion That Heals, Religion That Harms. Both of those are fabulous books. Uh, Ken Pargament uh, has a book called Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy, and he's co-author of a book that's just come out called Working with Spiritual Struggles in psychotherapy. Uh, Pargament is a psychologist. Uh, and so those are, those are resources I would share just off the top of my head. And uh, I appreciate your sharing this space. I really do believe that spirituality um, is such a, I mean, so the majority of people in this country identify as spiritual. Like, and I don't mean like 52%, I mean like 90%, 85, 90% say they're spiritual and, and maybe 70, 75% say that they're also religious. So this is a central resource and um, part of motivation, 
part of, of self-understanding and understanding the world for most people who come to us. And so, Beth, I appreciate you kind of sharing this platform to give attention to it. And hopefully um, people who've listened will work in this space and with this dimension of their, of their clients' lives with a bit more um, capacity. And I've really enjoyed it. I just appreciate the way you bring yourself, uh, your, your own energy and the, the questions you've asked. So just a big bow, um, a big bow to you and uh, for, for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you for joining us to talk about this topic um, because it is so core to what it means to be human. So thank you for your time in joining us. Again, for our listeners, this is Dr. Russell Seiler Jones, and you can find his website and reach out to him if you like. Thank you again for joining us, Russell. I really appreciate it. You've just finished listening to another exclusive continuing ed podcast by Clearly Clinical. If you like what you just heard and you need continuing ed credits, please visit us at clearlyclinical.com to check out our one-year membership, where you'll have access to our growing library of continuing ed podcast courses. Clearly Clinical, where our goal is to help you learn, grow, and shine.